when we started off this conservation development forum series uh, with Dr. Faisal Mullah's presentation, I gave a bit of background information about UF's relationships with a group of partner organizations from the Amazon region and how they challenged us to base our future work on supporting them as frontline conservationists who are the most effective practitioners of putting conservation into practice locally. And I also explained how we listened to their vision and strategies and that led us to focusing on biocultural conservation as an approach came from our partners. And then in that first forum, Dr. Faisal Mullah gave an inspiring conceptual overview of biocultural conservation field and making a bridge between rights and governance on the one hand and justice and conservation being effective on the other hand. And for example, through creation of community created and community managed reserves. So similar today, we're gonna to have a Dialogo de Saberes between our biocultural conservation working group that's been trying to advance our thinking about this and the Field Museum of Chicago. So the Field Museum's Keller Science Action Center has been using asset-based quality of life planning as a methodology for community engagement and to link community well-being and conservation, especially in the Peruvian Amazon, uh, with very good uh, results that are both concrete and at scale over the past 25 years. So, and just as a reminder, Conservation Development Forum, we're using a slightly different format from just a typical seminar. We're going to have a longer period of time, like an hour and a half or so, to hear different perspectives uh, and a structured discussion so we can learn from each other. Uh, Dr. Paula Unger will be our main speaker, and she'll be joined by colleagues Chris Jarrett and Anna Lamos. Paula is a biologist who's relatively new to the Field Museum, uh, but she has a very interesting history working in Colombia at the interface of protected areas and indigenous areas, conflict, policy. She's worked with national parks, with NGOs, with Trope and Bose, with the Humboldt Institute, uh, and Chris is a cultural anthropologist, has long experience with the Field Museum's asset-based quality of life planning approach and, and their ongoing work. He's published several articles that we've had an opportunity to review and learn about this experience from. And Anna is a former collaborator who's now deputy director of programs at the Legado Initiative, Anna Lemos. And she is a colleague of uh, TCD alum, uh, Tita Alvira, and now Pamela Montero. So really we're kind of closing the circle. A lot to sum up in just a few minutes, but I think the important thing is that you highlighted was that while we position ourselves here, both museums and, and universities, as well as NGOs supporting through partnership and knowledge, the work of indigenous communities and that that can lead to these results and larger scale impacts. So that will kind of be a bridge to the Field Museum's experience where they are showing us how they are putting into practice, supporting and collaborating with local communities to have these broader impacts. So with that, I'll pass it on to Paola as the first speaker for the Field Museum. Thank you, Cinemar. Thank you, Paul. That's what I wanted to say. Thanks, Chris. So, um, Paula Ungar, as you saw from the flyer, I'm going to do the first part of the presentation today, but I wanted to make sure that everybody uh, gets to know my colleagues who are also here, because what I'm going to present, I'm the one to, who's going to talk, but actually what I'm going to present is the outcome of collaborative work with many, many colleagues that have preceded me and also my present colleagues. And we're very lucky that three of them were able to join today, um, Chris, Anna, and Juliana. So I'm just going to let them introduce themselves. And then you'll see uh, in the conversation in the end, we'll also be able to, to listen to them more, more profoundly. Yeah. So, Chris. Sure, I can start. Um, thank you all so much for, for having us today. Um, I... 
I'm one of um, currently three social scientists in the Andes Amazon program um, within the Color Science Action Center at the Field Museum. Um, Paula is one of the other ones. Um, and uh, actually, we have two others Elliot, who's focused on uh, Elliot Oakley, who's focused on the Guyana uh, area of our work, and Cecilia Davila, who is working on the Putumayo Isa. Um, and we're also joined by Ana Lemos, who um, worked with us for several years and has since moved on, um, and Juliana do Brasil, uh, who I saw joined recently. Thanks, Juliana. Good to see you. Um, as uh, Bob said in the intro, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I come to this work um, at the Field Museum after several years of research in the Ecuadorian Amazon, uh, mostly focused on alternative livelihoods and um, thinking about how indigenous peoples engage with the market economy and how they balance that with um, subsistence livelihoods. And since I've been at the museum, I've um, worked on several of our main initiatives, rapid inventories, rapid biological and social inventories, um, some of the efforts around building a biocultural corridor in the Putumayawisa watershed um, across four different countries, um, and a little bit around um, reflecting on and, and trying to think about how to scale up some of the um, work that occurred before I came to the museum around um, supporting indigenous communities in Peru and developing Planes de Vida and thinking about community planning more, more broadly. Um, and um, yeah, we're, it's been a, uh, it's a program that was started about 20, 25 years ago um, and emerged through a unique a combination of, of individuals and uh, lines of work that unfortunately converged um, and, and sort of developed into um, the biocultural approach that we, that we work towards now. I mean, we work in, in partnership with a lot of different organizations in uh, the Amazon region and, and based in the U.S. Um, so uh, Paula is going to explain a lot more of that in detail, but um, that's how I'm, I'm coming to this space. And Paula, do you, would you like maybe Juliana to introduce herself briefly as the other um, current Field Museum staff and then Anita? Yeah, thank you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, nice to meet you to this Zoom platform. Uh, I'm Juliana do Brasil, and I'm from Brazil, as you can tell by the name. I am a Arapiu indigenous from uh, uh, Santarém do Pará, which is a state in the Amazon. But I have been working at the Film Museum for the last 20 years. And my job at the Field Museum is to promote and democratize science to field guides. So field guides are a visual tool that we are using for promoting scientific work done by people around the globe, basically. We work with um, more than 100 scientists per year, uh, publishing 100 field guides, the things you can see behind me and my wall. And lately, in the last five years, my biggest and more lovable mission in life is to create more of what you call biocultural field guides, because for a long time, the Film Museum work, uh, the work with the field guides was centered only in the work done by scientists, as we know. And now you are expanding this uh, project to work with indigenous communities like mine, and is my favorite, more amazing project. And I'm not talking much about that because Paul is going to elaborate a little bit more about what I do and how uh, in love with what I do I am. Nice meeting you all. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Ana Lemos. I am a former Field Museum um, employee. Now I am the Deputy Director of Programs at Legado. Um, I come at this work from an interesting point of view. Um, I'm a political scientist by trade. Um, I worked at Florida International University, so a little bit further down south from you all. Um, 
a, for a long time on international development programs and international research programs um, and really thinking about like how do we think about and a little bit of what Juliana was saying like how do we democratize science how do we start really thinking about um, the role of local people in science and in different um, aspects of what we would call like resource management also in um, just different forms of thinking about it. And so I come to this work thinking that I was not a scientist, thinking that I did not understand it, um, and realizing that there's so much more to conservation that is about people, you know? And that at the heart of this, if we don't understand people, and specifically in more places, um, as we keep going, as we keep advancing, as we keep um, really broadening this uh, definition of conservation, conservation without people doesn't work, no? And, some, and so I come to this work really thinking about it from that point of view. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here and to be sharing this with uh, my friends at the Field Museum um, and with you all too. I consider gators my friends, even though I'm a panther from down south, but really happy to, to share with you all and, and to keep this conversation going. So overall, just thanking you for this space and excited to share. Thank you, Anna, and welcome. Thank you, friends. It's so good to feel that we're all here together. So I'll be talking for a little bit longer, but I hope to have enough space to listen to everyone in the end. And many of the things that I'm going to present, Anna, Chris, and Juliana know more than I do. So please take notes and then adjust or correct or suggest whatever you feel. And then, yeah, we'll have time for conversation, hopefully. So I am Paula Ungar. I was initially trained as a biologist, but then I did my PhD in political ecology in Barcelona. And then I had training in different things. I became like a Frankenstein of, <laughs> of tra in training. Um, I have some background in philosophy of science, something in political ecology as my PhD, but also some things in ecological economics, anthropology. So it's a little bit of everything. And I, uh, before I start talking, I also wanted to mention especially two people who were really important to the work that I'm gonna present, that we're gonna present today. One is Tita Elvira, who you all already mentioned, Robert, because I'm the, uh, I'm honored to be an heir to her work before me. And of course, Ala Kawali, who like set the foundation for all this work. Um, so, uh, I first my first slide is just to give you a little bit of context of where I come from and what I did specifically related to maybe more explicit what can more explicitly be named biocultural conservation uh, before arriving to the museum. As I mentioned before, my PhD was uh, interdisciplinary and it was like many years ago, but that has like set the step for what I did afterwards. And this is did the title of one paper that came out of my thesis. And I did my, my research in Colombian national parks overlapped with indigenous territories. And I investigated the relationship between different forms of knowledge, indigenous, scientific, and officers' knowledge for the management and decision-making in national parks. And one of the conclusions of my dissertation was that um, co-creation of knowledge is one of the threads that can be like woven into the management of, of overlapped protected areas, but power relations play a central role. They are inextricably linked to co-creation of knowledge. So you cannot think about the one without thinking about the other. So as you can see, this already like resounds a lot with the conceptual framework that we're working with. And that's partly why I was so excited to, to participate here and um happy to to continue this conversation. Now, now Chris, please previous one still. Sorry. Uh, so after the previous in the previous slide, after my PhD, I've had I've worked with the Humboldt Institute with National Parks with Tropenbos Colombia, as uh, as Robert already mentioned. But I wanted just to mention two uh, collective research projects that I worked in or yeah policy-oriented writings that I participated in. One is the um, the intergovernment, the IPBS uh, platform 
specifically in the assessment report of the diverse values and valuations of nature. So that was like an international effort led by, I don't know, hundreds of researchers from all the continents. And the main, also one of the main conclusions of that assessment is that I'm just going to read out one sentence, the transformative change Changes needed to achieve ambitious biodiversity and development goals require confronting the statu quo and associated vested interests tightly tied to current institutions. So that's also um, like calls attention to the fact that there are structural things, structural sociopolitical variables that need to be taken into account for collaborations. And I also worked uh, in a similar um scenario but for Colombia in the national evalu in the national um evaluation of ecosystem uh, biodiversity and ecosystem services sorry and I was in charge of coordinating the chapter on what was initially called chapter on local and indigenous knowledge part of the collaboration because that chapter was also written by many authors of different disciplines and also of different uh, ethnic groups in Colombia was that we didn't want it to be named uh, local indigenous knowledge, but we named it um, biocultural um, diversity, uh, knowledge and practice for the care of life in the territories of indigenous peoples and local communities. So that was a big change, not only in the name, but also in the way we framed the chapter instead of uh, like listing or cataloging different forms of knowledge about the biodiversity, what we did was to account for um, the state and the threats to territories, to biocultural systems. So that give, gave this chapter like a strong political uh, character. Uh, and yeah, I think it's, it's the first step of a long, much longer process, but it was a really important uh, learning process. So that's just like the framework. So now I'm uh, si próxima diapositiva, Chris, por favor. And then I arrived to work at the Field Museum uh, one and a half years ago. Uh, inside the Field Museum, there is the Keller Science Action Center that, as Chris mentioned, right now is like a relatively small group of people within the this huge museum that whose main our main um, goal is to. It was uh, to put our expertise at the service of actual impact on the ground on conservation and people's well-being. So it's it's in the interface between research and decision making and practice. And it's also interdisciplinary. So it's like a very special place to work. That picture of the, is our team as it was a few months ago, maybe already a year ago. And now it has grown a little bit, but it's not much bigger than that. So it seems to be like a very small team for all the things that we um, do. Uh, but actually, and next next slide, please. Actually, we're a huge team because all our work is collaborative. We don't work just, the, just this group. In all the initiatives that we work on that I'm going to describe a little bit later, uh, the most important thing I would say is that we work in collaboration across scales and across types of scale uh, st uh, ah, stakeholders, sorry. <laughs> um, so we, because we believe that's the only form to address the complexity of the places where we work, including different forms of knowledge and different aspirations and assets and facilitating social processes and coalitions at different levels. So we work, on or the team has worked along for years in along four different initiatives. I'll work, I'll explain a little bit more the first two because those are the ones that I've been most involved in since I arrived. That's rapid inventories and the Putumayo Isa Biocultural Corridor. But I'll also mention the work that the museum did most of all before I arrived uh, on quality of life planning but I'm happy that Anita is here who has really a, lot, a long experience with that. And I'm also gonna mention the biocultural field guides, but I'm also very happy that Juliana is here and can help me uh, do like a better explanation of that. So rapid inventories are like quick, intensive 
surveys of the biological, geological, and sociocultural values of a landscape. Like that's like the initial dictionary definition. But the important thing is that the purpose of this collaborative uh, of this collaboration, which the museum leads, is to mobilize fast action for conservation in priority regions of high biological and cultural diversity, uh, and that they are um, they are as much about the product, which are recommendations for governments and for decision making makers about how to protect these landscapes as about the processes, because during like when we build up a rapid inventory, what we're doing is also bringing together diverse stakeholders from local communities to governments to uh, think together about the best ways to care for a uh, shared matter of concern, to put it somehow. Um, so again, next slide, please. Again, this is a highly collaborative process. This slide will probably be familiar to Anna. Uh, these are the, um, parties, the our main partners for a rapid inventory that was carried out a couple of, a few years ago in Peru and Colombia. There you can see international NGOs, local, like national NGOs, indigenous communities, indigenous um, organizations, and also local organizations and governments at different levels. So that's like the basis of the rapid inventory. Um, and how it works in the in practice is that we spend, they are called rapid because we spend three weeks more or less in the field. But actually in order to arrive to that moment, we spend more than a year or the, the team spends has spent more than a year uh, listening and learning from our partners in order to identify exactly how our work can be most useful and what the what needs and what questions are there for um, conservation and well-being. And that means listening and learning the picture that's there is the process with communities, but also that happens in offices in governments, with NGOs, so that we can like find that shared ground on which to build the rapid inventory. Then we build agreements also with like through formal MOUs with governments and NGOs and other organizations. Also, of course, very importantly, local universities, but also with communities because it's, yeah, that's part of uh, making it very clear to everyone like what the role is for everyone and what to what everyone can expect. The step step number three is the actual field work, the actual three, work, three weeks field work. And part of the team goes to the forests to do their research on um, uh, the field. I, I, I'm going to explain in more detail what happens in that stage in the, with the next slide. But shortly, like immediately after leaving the field, we engage in uh, dissemination of what happened during our field work. So we have presentations to communities and to government within the first couple of weeks of leaving the field. And then there is one year of very intense work for producing the reports and um, uh, presenting the outcomes at, to different publics and especially doing follow-up so that the, the recommendation to act, accompanying their implementation of the recommendations. So what happens during the field work is that uh, part of the team, and I repeat, the teams are made of uh, scientific researchers and also of scientific researchers coming from different countries and different institutions, but also local experts uh, from the communities and government officials, because part of the magic of the process is that decision makers are part of the research um, process. So the these are the themes in general that we that we work on, the kind of like the overarching questions that we try to answer are regarding the forests is like what is special about this place what is the composition what is the state of the diversity there and on the social side let's say both are very closely connected but on the social side we want to understand how people relate to this the place how historically they have related to the place and how they are doing that now how are local decision making processes carried out like and understanding the governance because conservation recommendations and need to be uh, articulated to that um, 
reality, like local reality that's already ongoing. Decisions are already being made in those places. So there is already like a governance structure in place. Um, and very importantly, we work with an asset-based approach that Bob already mentioned in the very beginning. That is, instead of focusing on the threats and the needs of the communities, we focus on the communities already existing institutions, knowledge, capabilities, and build upon that for answering our questions and for writing the recommendations. Next slide, please. So these are just two maps to show a little bit the scale of the work that the museum has done. Um, in total, it, 31 inventories have been carried out in seven different countries. Uh, 18 new conservation areas have been established based on or informed by rapid inventories work. Uh, and I'm talking about a diversity of conservation arrangements. These are not all like national protected areas. Some of them are, but many are also regional protected areas, co-managed protected areas, and also indigenous-led protected areas. Uh, next one, please. The second initiative that I've been uh, able to participate in is the Putumayo Isa Biocultural Corridor. The Putumayo River uh, flows along the border between Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia, and then flows into the Amazon River, the Solimões River in Brazil, through Brazil, through the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, it is a very exceptional river in the Amazon basin for many reasons. It's although it's one of the smallest tributaries of the Amazon, but on the one hand, it's, it's one of the uh, basins with uh, less transformed forest covers, and uh, it's only around one percent of deforestation until a couple of years ago. Here you can see the biodiversity levels of amphibians, mammals, birds, and trees, and it's really like uh, extraordinary this specific place. And I like to include this frog in this slide because it's a species that lives in the basin and was discovered for science thanks to the collaboration of action centers, scientists and South American partners, both academics and indigenous people. So it's a symbol of the work that we do in a way. Mm. The, this basin is also special because of its extraordinary cultural diversity more than 20 different indigenous peoples, including indigenous peoples in isolation live there and a great diversity of campesino and other communities. And they have like have been arriving there for centuries and also in the, in the more recent decades. Um, they have like a very complex diversity of organizations and uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to go into that, but you can imagine like the social complexity that's also there. And another thing that makes this basin special is that um, it has both like governments and indigenous organizations have managed to translate their care for this region into formal designations that protect the land in different ways. So um, around 40% of the basin is are officially recognized indigenous lands, most of them in Colombia. And national or regional natural parks make up 20% of the basin. And there is also more than 10, 10 to 15% of the remaining area is proposed areas. Uh, and so it's like also from this like more formal perspective, it's also really interesting and complex. Uh, so what do we do in this basin? Uh, our efforts have focused on strengthening the dialogues between stakeholders at different levels. So again, strengthening collaborations, including inhabitants from the basin, from different ethnic origins, but also institutions and organizations with influence on the basin from the countries or internationally. We do this through different activities, um, but the main one has been the development of a series of encuentros. Encuentros are gatherings of between two and five days of between 70 and 120 people in which neighboring communities, organizations and institutions meet. And as all our other activities, of course, it's not just three people organizing this gigantic thing, but we organize this with partners. So national NGOs and indigenous organizations and academia have helped us make this happen. 
the latest encuentro was in Santo Antonio Duisa in Brazil. Um, and next slide, please. These encuentros have a lot of different outcomes, some of them unexpected and magical. But in general terms, you could say that they have produced like a better collective understanding of the basin, the landscapes, the people's knowledge, their aspirations, their govern governance structures. And they also been very powerful in that they bring people together and facilitate conditions for collective action at different, le at different levels. I like this picture, especially this is from um, one of um, our latest or one of the latest um, Encuentro in Brazil. These are people who came from Peru, Colombia and the basin in Brazil. And they are sitting in the places that correspond to where their villages are along the river, where the territories. And so just the process of looking for their place in this space was wonderful and uh, motivated a lot of interesting conversations. And then from there, we did like a number of activities that helped um, achieve these, these goals. This was just one of the different activities that we did during those days. And I will be happy if we have time to talk more in detail about that Encuentro because it was really powerful. And next slide, please. The other thing that the museum has developed and has been very uh, important for uh, from a biocultural perspective is the quality of life planning. So it's a methodology for community engagement um, in which uh, communities based also based on a uh, community assets, as I mentioned before, and they are intended to empower communities to drive conservation to drive the conservation agenda and improve their well-being. So uh, communities get together and through a series of methods that the museum has co-created with partners, um, make organize their priorities for their territories so that this is a tool for them to organize their work and their priorities, but also for interlocution with for dialogues with government and other decision makers. Um, next slide, please. <laughs> so the last slide um, is about biocultural guides. I don't know if Juliana is still here. Uh, so biocultural field guides are guides that respond to communities' needs and interests. Uh, for instance, among those interests are local schools, local curricula, but also um, local monitoring of their lands, of communities' lands. And they are laid by communities. They combine different forms of knowledge. And they are also, as the other example or the other initiatives that I was explaining, mm -hmm. the process is as important, if not more important, than the outcome. I don't know, Juliana, if you agree, but I think you do because we've been talking, we've talked about this. Um, because throughout the process, communities get together and agree on what they think is important to be represented in these guides and what they want the guides for. Uh, so I'm sure Juliana, if we have time, she can explain a little bit more how these specifically these two examples were were created. But um, they are examples of these kind of like more collaborative uh, ways of doing field guides. Mm, and the last slide is just thank you. And I also just short explanation of why I use that particular image here. That's a chara tortuga charapa from Kawinari National Park in Colombia. And Kawinari was until very recently a pioneer and a very long standing successful story of a collaborative monitoring of uh, beaches on the uh, Caquetá River, like a, a collaborative initiative between indigenous peoples and park officers, and which had a huge impact on the population of Charapas, but also on collaborations between uh, national parks and indigenous people. So I, I like to keep that Charapita close to me to remind me that these things, how these things can wonderfully work in the fields. Thanks so much, Paula, for for that overview of our collective work together, and we're just so 
privilege to have you, um, especially given how much experience you've had doing this kind of work across so many different sectors. Um, and so I, I thought it, it might be interesting for all of us to um, start off with a, a few areas for discussion that we had um, talked about among Anna and Paula and I prior, and then um, we're all happy to um, elaborate about anything that was that was touched on during the presentation. Um, the first thing that I wanted to ask you, Paula, was, you know, um, it's so clear that you have experience um, working towards bio cons biocultural conservation at such a wide range of of contexts um, and research institutions, government agencies, and now in the context of the Natural History Museum. And I'm curious, um, and I think we're all probably curious about what you see as the opportunities and challenges that are unique to a natural history museum context in relation to these other contexts where you worked um, prior um, and, and how you how you see the the possibilities and the the difficulties of of this particular context of a natural history museum um, compared to those other contexts. Thank you, Chris. Um, yes, that's an interesting question because in some ways the Field Museum is not so different from the Humboldt Institute where I worked before in Colombia. It's this hybrid situation where we're not academia totally, and we're also not government or decision-making like NGO totally dedicated to practice. It's like this middle point between research and practice that's very interesting and powerful. So that's a privilege because you can uh, combine like the, the, um, yeah, the power of doing research like rigorous uh, interactions with questions and with data, but at the same time, those questions don't come from theory, but you feed the questions and feed the data and feed the information with, uh, in collaboration with the people who are affected by the by your work, and also from real life, so to say, questions. So that's like a privileged position, and that also puts you in a position where you can convene different actors that would otherwise not get together so easily. So. Um, that's especially true of the work from the Field Museum, not so much the Humboldt Institute is very close to the government. So that's like a not so easy position to be in sometimes. But the Field Museum has the ability of convening actors that otherwise would never like were, between which there are a lot of tensions. And that's part of the great things that we you can do when you are in that situation. Of course, that's also a huge challenge. And there are things related to scale that we might have the opportunity to talk more in depth later. But um, being in the global north and in Chicago and uh, trying to have an impact in the in the Amazon, for instance, is has also its challenges because what we want to do is to actually uh, leverage local assets, right? And sometimes it's um, it's difficult to make that clear when you are coming from a global north institution. So, and the important thing, I guess, is being open to difficult conversation and being transparent about our role and our work, I guess. Yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. I'm sure that in half an hour, I'll think of a better answer. But. <laughs> No, yeah, I just I think it's it's fascinating to see how um, the work the museum has intersected with a variety of different professionals in this space's individual career trajectories um, and how um, work at the museum for me and for many people has been um, sort of a space for experimentation and for learning and for um, connecting to why. Uh, oh, it's interesting to to think about these comparisons. Um, really, 
a lot of the work that Paula was describing um, at the museum. And now you're doing similar work, but based out of an NGO and based out of an NGO Legado initiative that, um, unlike the Field Museum, doesn't explicitly identify as a conservation organization. And so I was wondering um, if you could speak about what biocultural conservation means um, at Legado and, and what the transition from an explicitly conservation program context within a natural history museum to an NGO space, uh, what that transition has unlocked or potentially what are some new challenges um, in terms of enacting a biocultural conservation vision? Thanks, Chris. And you kind of cut off, so I assume you're talking to me. <laughs> um, yeah, well, sorry about that. Yeah, no, that's no, okay. Um, no, and so thinking a little bit about, you know, coming from this conservation organization, it wasn't just conservation, no, as what Paula was, you know, I, I, talking a lot about. I worked mostly on the component number three that Paula was sharing about the quality of life plants. And so it really was enveloped in this conservation for well being, no. So there was this, like, at the intersection of both of those things. And so, um, what I do now at Legado is that, no, it's working on these plans that are called um, community legacy plans, where, you know, we put, so the what Legado's purpose is, is we work with IPLCs, you know, in areas that are important for biodiversity, um, to ensure that they have the tools and resources to um, have in the partnerships that they need to design and implement, you know, solutions that benefit both their communities, their landscapes and themselves, no? And so this is what we call, what we call a thriving future, no? And so for me personally, and I think for Tita as well, it seemed like the natural progression, no? And biocultural conservation, you know, defined as like these integrated strategies, right? Not working in silos. And I think as an NGO, um, but with this, you know, museum academic background, it also unlocks these potentials to work together and in collaboration with other sectors, no, looking at it, um, you know, not just with academia, not just with government, not just with, you know, indigenous uh, federations or organizations, but looking at, at things, solutions, issues from this more integrated manner, no, how environmental health is really closely tied to culture, no, it's also tied to education, it's tied to human health and how all of that comes together. And I think, you know, being in the position that we are as Legado does give us that opportunity. And at the same time, it's, we're kind of a weird fish. <laughs> People are always asking, so like, what do you do? Like, what, what box can we put you in? No, and so, and that for us has been difficult. It's been a challenge because we say, you know, we can't say we're in the business of thriving futures. What does that mean? And in Spanish, we would say, how do we eat that? Como se come eso, right? Like we're constantly answering that. And in that, you know, I would say that the work from the museum and as Paula was saying at the beginning, you know, building on the shoulders of so many great people, um, including, you know, a lot of people that came through the museum and our local partners, no? And thinking about the practitioners, people who use this and people who not only, you know, carry this on in their institution, but the local community members, no? And I think, um, the best thing for us has been, you know, meeting people where they're at, you know, building these relationships um, and thinking about really what is, and I'm going to use the word end user in a very like utilitarian form, like what is the end user, which is the community, you no, know, the landscape, um, this end goal that we're trying to get. So how do we get there? And so constantly working backwards. And I think as an NGO, but with these, um, collaborations, this interdisciplinary background that I, you know, coming from the museum and coming from all of the other places that I think Tita and I have come, you know, have gone through and all the wonderful friends, including some here, you know, that we've had and how all of this just builds together. And I think it does give us that freedom, but then we do have these challenges as an NGO on thinking about that. But yeah, so thinking about like biocultural conservation in this more integrated manner and how strategies for conservation and well-being of local people who have stewarded these places, who are the main users, right? Whether it be direct use or indirect use, 
you know, how do we really get to what these what community priorities are and how do we implement them based on what Paula was saying, you know, people's assets. Now, how do we build on that? And so that's how we would define it and how what it looks like on the ground for us. Yeah, thanks for that, Anna. I think, you know, a lot of what you're saying really draws out this point that um, Sinomar mentioned at the beginning and is, you know, cuts through this as a thread. I'm sure um, Bob and others, this is something that's come up before, which is the polysemic uh, nature of this term biocultural and the way that it's sort of one uh, one experiment in pushing uh in this in this direction for conservation for a more just holistic uh understanding and approach to caring for territories um but it's not the only one and there there are adjacent uh turns of phrase and concepts that are speaking to that similar vision so uh, you know this idea of conservation for well-being was one of those at the museum or has been one of those and part of the challenge with that is uh, the directionality of that. So conservation is the thing, but it's for well-being. And sometimes that can be a slippage where there's an assumption that conservation, environmental conservation or conventional conservation per se benefits local communities or per se translates into well-being for local communities. Um, and so, you know, one way that we've tried to get around that is to say conservation and well-being rather than <laughs> getting rid of the directionality. But the basic challenge remains, right, of, of how are you pushing these two uh, concepts that are like fundamentally Western, uh, based on Western ontological categories, how are you pushing these two things into integration and in that process, uh, opening up new ways. that align better with um, the way of the world is powerful with uh, see their relationship to the territories, right? So there is a piece about like how the conceptual translates into practical uh you know policy and and uh programmatic strategies. Um but there's also a, a challenge and attention here that um is tricky, which is around scale. And this is something else that um, Sinomar mentioned uh, in the intro and came up uh, when Paula was describing sort of the the benefits of being a distant, uh, in some context, seemingly more neutral convener, um, but also the challenges of, of doing committed on the ground work in a region that's very, you know, geographically distant from uh, where the home institution is. And so um, the other topic that I just wanted to raise with Paula and Anna before um, we open it up to everyone else was, was around this question of scale. Um, and I think this is one of the big challenges and opportunities for mainstreaming or expanding the scope of biocultural conservation is to find ways to engage stakeholders at multiple scales. Um, and connecting the development of grassroots strategies with strategies to influence uh, powerful decision makers at higher scales. And I think these are these are approaches that work in potentially complementary, but at times also um, contradictory directions and that there are uh, value trade-offs or or you know there's a, a tricky balancing mechanism that's that's inherent in trying to do those two things at once. Um, and yeah, so, you know, I see your uh, comment in the chat. That's exactly where I'm going. I think for us, um, the work in trying to build this biocultural corridor in the Putumayo Isa is the clearest example where we've really grappled with, with that challenge. Like, are we building popular grassroots uh, movements in the Putumayo Isa that are challenging governments to recognize their rights and to do all the things that are on the left side of that graphic that you showed? Um, or are we, um, you know, working the, from the top-down perspective to try to transform powerful institutions from within so that they're more responsive to communities? 
And ultimately we tried to do both, but um, one of the things I wanted to ask Paula was like, maybe you, you mentioned these encuentros and the last encuentro in Brazil, but I was wondering if you maybe wanted to say something about how we tried to balance engagement across these different scales in, in building the encuentro. Um, because we often think of convening as a neutral practice or like, oh, we're just going to have this event. We're going to bring a bunch of people together and they're all going to be engaged in dialogue. But there are all these sorts of practical decisions that are made that have all sorts of political and um, uh, theoretical implications. Um, so, yeah. Do you want to speak to this a little bit, Paula? And I can compliment if you'd like. Uh, you're muted, Paula. Sorry, thanks. No, something that it just we were talking with Anna and Chris before this is like a very important, apparently very simple thing, but it's very important for this challenge of bridging scales. And it's actually going to the places, <laughs> going to the places where people are and inviting others, other like decision makers to go to the places. So the last encuentro that we did, it was in Santo Antonio Isa, which is a relatively small village in the mouth of the Isa River, which is the same Putumayo that in Brazil is called Isa. Uh, it's very, it's not easy, not an easy access. Uh, and we had initially planned to do this encuentro in Leticia, in the Colombian capital, like the Amazonian capital of Colombia. And then like a few months before the encuentro, uh, Corinne has this, had this crazy idea that seemed crazy in the beginning, but it makes a lot of sense for many reasons to actually go to the place. So we managed, it was crazy, <laughs> we did it like a lot of additional work to make that happen but uh, actually having the big NGOs and representatives of national governments of the three countries Peru, Colombia and Brazil go to the place and actually be there with local communities and also eat, as part of the event we brought groups we did groups and we brought them to visit experiences in the field so not all the encuentro was like inside a place but we went to the um we had like a group went with the fishers to see the catch of the day another group went to a close by a village or a suburban place in Santo Antonio Isa to see to visit a community that's that's um struggling to get their land uh, officially recognized by the government. So we went there and we listened to their uh, story. And then another group went to visit a group of women who are trying to, who are producing uh, oil based on andiroa seeds. So just going to the places and bringing people from different uh, organizations, from different levels, within organizations to the places is a way to like very pragmatically cross those scales. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, um, I, I definitely agree with you about the, the location itself. And there's another dimension that you're touching on that, that feels important in our experience, which is, um, essentially creating experience uh creating shared experiences between actors at from different sectors and different scales so it's not about a conversation about a re realities but it's about living uh experiences in the field during rapid inventories together um or living these these uh field visits during the encuentros and there's just a di different fisheries inference that you can have uh, offload pirarucu from boats than you can have if you're just sitting in a conference room. Um, and so I, I'm not sure, you know, how much that's been a part of the conceptual discussions that you all have been having about biocultural conservation, but I do think that that, um, in our experience, has been a really critical mention is like creating sensory shared sensory 
uh, experiences in the territory on the ground. Um, and so there's like almost like a phenomenological dimension to understanding this, these connections that, that for us has um, been really powerful and also has, has been important for unlocking some of the, the political potential of, um, you know, of reckons different uh, uh, oh yeah curious to discuss more as well I had for Anna about scale also a lot of our work at the museum and I know has also been a challenge um, at, is thinking about if your goal is to directly support um, local or regional indigenous federations or local people's organizations. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of the challenges between balancing that with respecting and engaging with national level indigenous organizations or representative bodies. Um, because I think there is a tendency in this sector and this in this work to um, sort of start interventions to try to work in the territory by going th through larger collectives like a Koika or an Orpio or something like that. And into the, the territory through that and there are doors that are open by that AG and there are also um, challenges that come from that. So I don't know if that's something you'd be um, willing to talk about Anna, and then um, Sorry if we've sort of taken up. No, actually, this is perfect. We can and, open up for other. I think what Chris is raising also may be quite relevant to Faisal's question, which is here in the chat, which you probably haven't seen, but I think it's quite related. So I'll just go read that. Uh, and uh, because Faisal said, Cinemar noted the importance of enabling measures to the success of biocultural driven conservation. And in my mind, this includes indigenous rights, governance, self-determination, and other elements of indigenous sovereignty. So Paula, he's asking, do you think that NGO focus on protecting discrete elements of biocultural diversity, such as culturally significant plant or animal or habitat, is misplaced when they should really be working in support of indigenous nation building? In Canada, we use the term land back. So that may or may not be kind of along the same lines of what you're asking, Chris. So. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, that that question of indigenous nation building is a question of um, different scales of indigenous organizing and the way that indigenous movements have grappled with this um, complex tension between creating representative bodies at higher scales to be able to engage with multilateral negotiation spaces to access um, the big financiers and and decision makers at the highest levels, like that's a necessary um, development. But there's also when you work in local communities, a tension often between that scale of operation and um, the way that uh, yeah local communities are organized, even if they're nested within a, a broader organization. Um, and thinking about how you yeah, that you work at, at both of those scales in a way that feels respectful and and constructive um, and contributes to a broader kind of indigenous sovereignty building, um, but but at multiple levels and from multiple angles, right? I don't yeah, know, what a... Anna, does any of that resonate with you? Is there a thread that I... Oh, Chris, you keep breaking up. Um... Yeah, no, I just, what you said sums up perfectly, you know, what has been my experience. Um, and in particular, I speak from uh, the Peruvian context, no working in um, the Peruvian Amazon and different levels with different organizations. And Chris, just what you said is what we found, know that working at the hyper-local level with indigenous federations or indigenous organizations might be very different, um, or even the expectations that are generated or just the way of working is very different than at other levels, no? And so, um, and also thinking about capacity building, no? Like how, what is, what what do we mean by capacity building or like co increasing capacities in, in certain organizations and for what? No, a lot of the time it's been, when we do these quality of life plans, it's been, 
eh, and I'll say it in Spanish and then I'll find the translation in English, eh, generar capacidades en liderazgo, to strengthen our capacity in a leadership. What does that mean, no? Again, how do we eat this? ¿Cómo se come eso, no? And so we, what we've done in our work has also been, so how do we keep defining that? How do we have communities lead or these leaders really get down and drill down to what that means, no? And for me personally, I've worked pretty much at the local level or the regional level um, with indigenous organizations, but I have found that it has been, you know, exactly what you were saying, you know, these sometimes these tensions or sometimes these lack of understanding and just because you know there are indigenous organizations at the national level doesn't mean that you know they they don't they also don't have their challenges of you know knowing what is happening at the local context or at the regional context as well they're not void of the, those issues and so I think it's it's really looking at organizations from you know, uh, this point of view of they are representative organizations, right? And so how do we uh, keep that in mind and not say, you know, and, and try to figure out what is the right scale for the work that you want to do? Now, I also think because um, I personally work at the community scale, that's the scale that makes sense, right? And how do we communicate with other organizations and how do we, you know, link up with other organizations? But for the work that, that we do with the quality of life or um, community legacy plans, they are at that hyper local level. Right. Yeah. I, I I know Louisa, you've raised your hand. Is it on the same topic or should Paula answer first and then come back? Uh, no, it's not on the same topic. So okay. yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Paula, I just wanted to add a little bit to your question about where NGOs should be focusing. Uh, and I think the challenge is not to answer that ourselves, but ask actually the communities. Because I've seen really powerful work done around specific elements of biodiversity, for instance. So it depends. And sometimes that has a lot of political power to focus your efforts and your visibility on one particular species. So I think we need to start thinking, OK, let's ask the communities about what they think is important for them right now. And then based on that, like leveraging the assets that they already have and putting our work like at the service of that. So yeah, I just wanted to to add that. But, and, and Faisal, do you want to then, um, do you feel was your question answered or do you want to, I think I see you've written something in the chat. Do you want to expand? Yeah, on no, that? Sure, I, I totally agree with Paula. I, mean, I think that's that's the appropriate that's the appropriate response. And then I'll just add that, you know, for, for some people that are interested in policy, um, you know, biocultural diversity is not explicitly referenced in the recent Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. There's no explicit reference of culturally significant species. And for some people, they might see that as a disappointment, but I don't because these critical enabling measures that Sinomar mentioned that Paola and Chris have talked about are referenced. There's there's references to indigenous rights, rights based approach to conservation, indigenous knowledge, governance, uh, customary practices that have net benefits for biodiversity. And I sort of see those as touchstones for us now to advocate with indigenous peoples for radical overhaul of policy, including things like protected areas that are in, in my country, Canada can be very problematic in terms of negatively impacting indigenous peoples and their rights. So, anyways, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Faisal, for bringing that up. Very interesting point for our dis discussion and reflection. So on to you, Louisa. Thank you for being here and go ahead. Thank you. And first of all, I want to, to say how delighted I am to see how far uh, the biocultural conservation approach has gone at the Field Museum for a little bit of context uh, about 25 years ago when I was just beginning to think of biocultural diversity and biocultural conservation in particular. I was for a couple of years uh, at Northwestern University uh, in Evanston and uh, also affiliated with the Field Museum, um, which happened after a conversation with Alaka Wali. So it all comes around. Uh, I gave a, a little talk there, and uh, we, we had uh, many really um, uh, great interactions during that period of time. Uh, I wanted to, uh, for my question, I wanted to go back to something that uh, 
uh, Chris mentioned about uh, this um, um, shift from talking about conservation for uh, well-being to conservation and well-being. I think that that I can see why uh, that shift, because of course there has been a lot of um, flack uh, uh, thrown at the uh, at fortress conservation, which uh, is not really, uh, which is shoved down the throats of uh, of, of indigenous peoples, indigenous communities, uh, based on an assumption that we uh, Western conservationists uh, know what's best instead of recognizing the longstanding stewardship uh, of indigenous people and and the fact that conservation uh, done conservation with self determination basically is what uh, indigenous peoples themselves uh, will want to do because they recognize their direct dependence and interdependence uh, with the natural world and in fact they should uh, should be have been and should uh, continue to be our teachers in uh, in that sense um so I, I think that it makes sense on the one hand on the other hand uh which conservation if done in that way wouldn't be for human well-being uh, it, it, it's obvious that it, that uh uh, deforestation is not uh, in the interest of human well-being either of the local people, uh, indigenous communities and, and, lo and local communities uh, or anyone else in the world. So we have to also be careful about not going down the slippery slope as if, you know, we're starting thinking of trade-offs, etc. There are no trade-offs on life. And, uh, and that way, I think we always need to keep in mind whatever we do. And indigenous peoples again uh, show the way. It's it's uh, self evident for them. Uh, I'll never forget how I began to to learn about uh, that idea, which was doing my field work in Chiapas among uh, Mayan communities. And I, I realized as a linguistic anthropologist that they were talking about the health of the land in the same way that they were talking the same words, the same concept uh, as the the health of people and that's when the light bulbs started going up. So um, on the one hand, yes, we, we want to stave off the idea of fortress conservation. On the other hand, we I think we need to keep in mind that conservation done justly and respectfully uh, is indeed for uh, everyone, everyone's well-being. Yeah, thank you for that, um, for that comment, Luisa. You know, I think part of the part of the challenge here is that that term um, conservation itself is also a polysemic term, right? It on some level denotes, uh, similar to the term development, uh, a historical project of dispossessing uh, native people and local communities of territory for the sake of being, uh, Areas of exclusive access and use by whether it's royal members of royal court or Euro American men or you know depending on the context there's there's a very specific uh, history to the hegemonic uh, project of conservation understood in that way but that term also uh, sort of. Um, engages with or intersects with longstanding practices of care and stewardship by native peoples and by um, all sorts of populations uh, around the world that maybe don't identify as, as indigenous, but do have um, deep investment in, in caring for and in you natural resources and uh, so, you know, they live um five you know continuing in places over a really long and so part of the challenge like, engaging um with conservation as this hegemonic historical project and trying to push push it or pull it in a different direction um and whether it's biocultural or whether it's rights based um or some other kind of modifier there's there's a piece of that that's that's denoting that effort to transform this hegemonic project. Um, but there's also 
uh, a risk in in leaning too heavily on that term um, that has you know all of these very specific connotations, mm -hmm. and and so that's yeah, that's part. Paula or Anna want to comment on that as well, or no? Instant. Okay. Paula, oh. okay. Anna, no? Okay. Oh, Anna, Anna does. No? Okay. Well, I, then, but Louisa started by congratulating the Field Museum, and I just wanted to go back to uh, Maria's question about how is your work shared within the Field Museum and how does it get translated to the public, which has to do with kind of the, the mission of the Field Museum as a public institution in Chicago versus an organization that's seeking to protect life. So how, how does that translation happen? Hmm, <laughs> that's a really good question. I think the Action Center has always been in an um, unsettling position. I don't know if that's a correct way to say it. It's like challenging the museum constantly. And I think out of that challenge, have come really productive things like Alaka's work, for instance, and Debbie Moscovich, who was also founder of this work. And I think we are all the time within a questioning our the fact, I mean, let's say, let's say how to put this. Like as has been said here, conservation is historically like a colonial understand it can be like very colonially framed and a museum is also by nature like a colonial institution right so the fact that we are in in a museum makes us constantly question our work and in what ways are not are we not repeating or perpetuating the work of a 19th century explorer who is going to remote places to <laughs> gather information for a museum in the first world. So I think we the, the Action Center has managed to do that very well, to actually keep like a space for doing things in a different way. And I think in in many in many occasions we have the fact that we're part of a museum and a public facing institution has helped. A lot in like amplifying our work, of course, and maybe that's even more evident. I don't. I did mention that in the beginning, but the Keller Science Action Center has three programs, and the other geographically based program is Chicago Region. So it's a team of people that are, does seem very similar work to the one that we do, only in the Chicago region. So they work with communities, and they also are inter interdisciplinary team, and they work because of practical geographical reasons they work much closer with the museum uh, facilities and with the museum departments and I think that's a really interesting question to ask them and I actually was thinking that it would be interesting to have someone from Chicago participate in this forum because they have like similar challenges they are also implementing like a biocultural frame uh, but in a very different context so that's that's also like another perspective on on this kind of conversation, Chris and 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 I'm sure you have more things to say about the fact that we're in a museum and how our relationship with the museum uh, is part of the work we do. Yeah, I'll let you take this one, Anna, since my connectivity has been challenging. I'm sorry about that. No, no worries. It's definitely different. Um, it's not something that a traditional museum does, although I do, I would say, um, I think the, um, um, the Natural History Museum, the American Natural History Museum does have similar work. Mm -hmm. um, however, it's not, when you think of a museum, a natural history museum, what do you automatically go for? Dinosaurs, dioramas, um, pots, <laughs> dead animals. <laughs> Affectionately, we call ourselves the dead zoo. Right. And so what like what does this kind of work like? How does it fit into there? And so a little bit of the the thought of it was, 
what are we doing for, and I'm going to say it in like the plainest language, what are we doing for the things that are out there? Right? What are we doing for biological diversity that is out there? What are we doing for, or what can a museum do? Advocate for user platform, use the tools that we've developed through the science of being a natural history museum. How can that be put into practice, into action for conservation today? No, not conservation for the things that are, you know, that have existed, which is also important, but our center is more focused on, on like, what can we do today for the things that are here today, you know, and that we want to be here for more generations. Um, and so in a way, the work that the museum does, as Paula was saying, is working in these two geographies, you know, um, very closely in the Chicago region with different, with different organizations, different stakeholders and collaborators, um, and when we think about like this work with IPLCs, it's also like work within like the community where you're at. And I think this is something that the museum, you know, is is really trying to to figure out. Now, how do we it's not just selling tickets. It goes beyond selling tickets. How do you have people have this connection to the place where they live? You know, in a place like Chicago that can be, you know, very urban. Um, and at the same time, people have very strong connections to these areas, you no, know, to these places. Um, I shared in the chat there. Um, field guides, you know, the um, the website to look at our field guides. There's a whole bunch of field guides, you know, in the Chicago region. It's very important for migratory birds. And so how do we think about all of these things in the place where the museum is as well? You no, know? and so when we think about biocultural uh, conservation, it, you know, for the museum, it really took on this life of, it's not just these places and from the museum's perspective that are far away, but what can we do in our own backyard, no? Um, and how do we strengthen these ties that already exist? No, we see people's cultural identities, these really strong uh, beliefs and knowledge of the world around them. Um, and so one of the things that we do, as I said, was the field guides also um, through different exchange opportunities. I also think the museum working in the museum gives you this really interesting perspective on meeting people from different um, departments and talking about this. Um, through seminars and other knowledge exchange opportunities, and also um, the opportunity to bring folks from, you know, from whether it be Brazil, Colombia, Peru, you know, to come to the museum, no, and look at collections, give, you know, uh, talks, give like these, and um, share the information that they know they they deeply, you know, hold, um, and can help tell the story, you know. Um, and most of all, really engaging in other ways beyond technical reports, which are important. There's a very important space for technical reports. And how do we make this in, you know, bite-sized chunks where decision makers can use it, indigenous peoples can use it, you know, what is the right way for the right audience? And these are things um, that the, our field guides team and our science communications team is also working on. And one of those things, as Paula mentioned, were these biocultural field guides. No, how do we think about these things in a different way? No. So that's another way that um, with within the museum, we communicate with each other and with the community outside of the museum that usually thinks, you know, the field museum, we have a great Tyrannosaurus Rex, but what goes beyond that? No, like what, what is the other work that we do? Um, and yeah, it's 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 strange. When I worked at the museum, people would be like, "What do you do again? Don't you like, you know, like don't you look at plants?" I'm like, "No." <laughs> you know, it was it was a it's a different work that you know may not seem like a, a some a place like the field museum is the right place to do it, but I see it as it is the place to do it. No, it's such a privileged place to do it. I would say because of all of the knowledge and the opportunities for this knowledge exchange that just enhances this um, concept of biocultural conservation. Okay, and Francisca, I see that you have somewhat of a follow-up question to this and, and maybe that will kind of bring us towards a wrap up thinking together about how we might, you know, collaborate more in following up on this really interesting exchange of knowledge and experiences that we've had today. Go ahead, yeah. Francis. Thank you, Bob, and thank you everybody for this very rich exchange of knowledge. Um, I was wondering, um, knowing I having so many conversations with Paula to Ankarin, how could a program like TCD help support your team, team's work and vice versa, how you can also support the work of TCD? 
And would your team be open to identify the shared goals between our institutions and areas of collaboration? A little bit of what you do when you go to the field and think about shared goals. Is there, is there space for that between these two institutions? Sure, I'm, I'm sure Chris also has something to say, but my first reaction is, sure, please, let's, let's do that. We are, as I showed, a small team, and it's important to keep not only talking and enriching like our concepts and methods, but also actually thinking about how, how we can mm -hmm. practice together. So, yeah, I think that would be like a really interesting thing to do. We, we always need allies. <laughs> But I think the question would then unpack in terms of, well, what would our role be? Like, what's the difference? Like, like mm -hmm. you explained very well, I think, kind of a being in a privileged position of a research organization that's also action oriented. University is a research organization that's not necessarily action oriented, but it also has an education role. So, but maybe we do longer term research I don't know. So just, I would just like to think about, you know, what is the complementarity? Yeah, I can do like a first reaction to that, but I'm sure there are other ways to, many other ways to collaborate. We very often see questions that need like longer term, term engagement with the themes and with the people. Mm -hmm. And we just don't have time to be that long in the field or that long in the same place. And like very, very exciting questions that I sometimes feel like I want to go back to university and do a PhD yet just to answer these questions, questions <laughs> some more conceptual about, for instance, the, the challenge of scale or the, yeah, questions related to political ecology and to power imbalances and to, but also some more like methodological uh, like developing tools for doing what we do in a collaborative way, doing collaborative research about specific, I don't know, species, ecosystems, things like that. The the biocultural uh, field guides do a little bit of that. They stay a little bit longer with people. The um, quality of life planning are also like a little bit of a longer term engagement, but doing uh, research, especially if it's done from this perspective of collaboration and of co-creation of knowledge, I think that would be like a really important gap to fill together. Yeah, an another idea that I have and a real gap that I feel like exists in this space is around um, monitoring, measuring, evaluating, um, because um, it, it, in my experience and, and things that I've seen, um, you know, even though measuring conservation, even in the conventional sense of environmental conservation is a challenge because are you just talking about forest cover? Are you talking about the health of populations? Like there are methodological challenges on measuring um, conservation from a purely environmental or ecological perspective. But when you expand out to these broader um, holistic systems, um, coming up with indicators that are legible to donors and to decision makers at institutions um, that feel concrete and tangible uh, is, is a major challenge at times. And sometimes that means that, um, you know, experiments in, in pushing for more integration or in trying to deepen this nexus um, are are threatened or are not seen as having impact in the way that establishing a new protected area that's X number of hectares is this really flashy kind of impact. Um, and so, you know, I think both in terms of research and in terms of like the, the research action nexus, um, finding ways to think about how do you measure collaboration? How do you measure um, integration well, through dialogos de saberes, all of these different sorts of things that we're saying are so important. Um, I think that would be a useful thing to think together with, and it's it's an important um, gap that I see in in general in this space. 
Go ahead, Betty. You're mute. Yep. Yeah, thanks for that. It just made me think, you know, about, you know, these these outcomes, you know, that you've got to show to the donors. And so when you can have a protected area of, you know, whatever size, bam, it's there, right? Whereas the kinds of things that that you all are doing are things that perhaps you're not going to see that impact immediately, right? It's going to take six months. It's going to take a year. It's going to take five years for those really impacts to emerge from, from those sorts of interactions and programs and activities. So thinking about how you can best structure indicators that you know, are, are show some sort of future predictive outcome, you know, that donors are going to latch on to and appreciate rather than, okay, we got that, you know, 1 million hectares protected, it's all safe now, you know, so, so, so strategizing and thinking about what those indicators might be could be really beneficial. Right. Yeah. Yes, please in caps lock and bold. <laughs> we yeah. have that challenge all the time it's like it's difficult even with partner i mean not not only with funders but even with colleagues sometimes to make visible like what's the impact of this more uh, less i wouldn't say less visible because those maps of a protected areas are very visible on maps but not so much in people's like in sometimes not so much in the territories but it's really difficult to think about meaningful indicators for that. So yeah, it's important. Okay, great. Well, I, as I put in the chat, that's a whole another in-depth discussion that we could and should have. So thank you. But we've had a lot of different interesting angles on biocultural conservation and the work of the Field Museum here today. So thank you very much. Chris, Paula, Anna, especially, Juliana, we didn't hear from, but glad she was here. Uh, is in the chat, there's two more uh, conservation development forums on different aspects uh, that are coming up in late March and April. Uh, so hope we'll let you know, uh, we'll remind you, but hope you can make it then. Okay, so thank you very much, all of you, and have a great afternoon.